Paul, please tell us uh, about you and what are the activities of the Environmental Network of Loreto, Red Ambiental Loretana. Well, my name is Paul McCauley. I'm a De La Salle brother, working here, or Christian brother as we're known in the States, um, working here in Peru for the last 18 years and in Loreto specifically, in the Amazon, Peruvian Amazon, uh, for the last nine years. And five years ago, we founded the uh, Loretan uh, Environmental Network, which we, in siglas in, in Spanish, we call the RAL. We founded it precisely to have some vigilance over the use of the natural resources here in Loreto and also to uh, look after the human rights of those who live amongst the natural resources, particularly the riverside people and the indigenous people. What, has been, what are the major challenges for the future of the forests of Loreto? Loreto is a very big region. Can you please tell us what's the size of this region? Right, we're talking about uh, Loreto would be about uh, probably a third of the size of, well not quite, let's just say about a fifth of the size of Peru. It's a huge region uh, which still has some excellent forests, a lot of being damaged but there's still a chance to save some of them. Uh, the biggest challenge is one, to have a legal management of the forest and secondly to have a management that includes the local people as actors and not just as workers who are left poor. Um, we've got a system that's corrupt, uh, a system that works on a chain of exploitation where a, a small cupola, uh, a small group in Lima, in Pucallpa or in the international community earn huge amounts of money from the wood and simply exploit a whole chain right down to the people who actually live in the communities. Uh, they're deceived in terms of the measures of the wood, the size of the wood, the value of the wood. Um, they never get out of poverty and yet they live in an extremely rich area. So illegality and corruption are the biggest challenges we've got. The international community is very interested in CITES species, those specifically for Peru or mahogany and cedar. Could you please tell us a little bit about what's been the experience in Loreto? Right, well those two species basically are, are, are finished. In terms of commercial uh, logging they're finished. Uh, in terms of uh, vigilance, uh, in Reina has been one of the accomplices in the illegal uh, extraction of wood. We had 20,000 uh, cedar logs uh, stopped uh, over a year ago, precisely because of the intervention of CITES. But once uh, the national body in Reina actually took control of that wood, within a short space of time, it was then liberated to the international market and that wood has been stolen from Loreto with all the blessing of the Peruvian National uh, Protection System. So I'd say that the international community are not doing a very good job and um, in terms of uh, really blocking the illegal system in Peru, they need to do a lot more. And, and I'd say they all need to think about the other species in danger, which are the human species. The, the indigenous people and the riverside people are no longer able to live sustainably in their areas because they've been robbed of their natural resources and continually they're coming to the cities as refugees. Could you please tell us a little bit about this story uh, that you were telling us before in Spanish about the Amazon area that you went, you went to court with this? Right, exactly. The, uh, when in, in 2004, when the uh, forestry concessions were launched in this area, uh, we put in a legal uh, claim saying that they were illegal in our area for two reasons. The, they'd never done any studies, environmental studies, as to the impact of the forestry concessions here. And when they did them, they sold them off at 30 cents per uh, hectare, which is 30 cents for two and a half acres. And so we put in a claim for this area, which was 700,000 hectares of forest that was handed over to private, uh, mainly corrupt management. Um, we won the case. We won the case in the uh, Tribunal Constitutional, in, in the tribunal, tribunal in Lima. But we won that in 2006. We're now 2009, and the wood is continually being extracted illegally. I think it, we can't even trust in the legal system here. There are powers much bigger than the legal system that permit the illegal extraction. You're describing a really complicated, dire situation, Paul. 
Where would you think the solutions could come from? I think CETIT and other groups really have to decide whether they want to be a part of the future or whether they're going to be part of a, uh, simply a, a museum of groups who acted in the past. Uh, the challenges now are really against an international mafia, against an economic system that's doing systematic damage here and I really think it's a question of those honest governments, those honest institutions who really want to help to ensure, for example, that any financing from the uh, Inter International Monetary Fund or from the World Bank does not go to corrupt governments like Peru. It can't go to the present system. It has to go directly to communities, preferably to the communities that are organized as uh, the indigenous communities are organized or the local districts in the riverside areas where they also could be organized and have a budget, a realistic budget, where they could do their direct dealing with certified wood, but it can't go to the present corrupt system. Now, Paul, the, the last few weeks we've seen in Peru the horrible situation of these massacres uh, where people have been killed, policemen, indigenous peoples, uh, all because of the struggle of these groups against these laws that are going to be having a direct impact on their lands, on their resources. What can you tell us about the situation? What's, what is going on in Peru? What's behind all this? Why, why are people dying in that way, trying to defend their lands? What's, what's at stake here? What's at stake basically is, particularly in our area, this area that you can see here covered with the, all these areas in green are the areas that are considered to be available in the future for forest exploitation. Um, the, in, on top of this, there's another map that perhaps you, you'll see in another moment, where the petrol lots, all the petrol lots are in, on top. Every square meter of Loreto is covered by petrol lots. So we've got two big problems. We've got an exploitive system of the forest, which benefit a small uh, mafia, uh, international and national. And we've got a system of petrol exploitation, which is irrational and incredible uh, expansion in petrol uh, exploitation. Um, so I'm afraid the, the situation is extremely serious, and it's a consequence of the desire of this government to get online for the international, the TLC, the um, trade agreement with the United States, and make sure that the investors can get in and work without any problems. You just mentioned that the, the free trade agreement with the US, that free trade agreement has its own forestry chapter. How can this, I mean, comparing this current situation and the fact that there is a new government, new administration in the US, there is this good opportunity with this forestry chapter, how can this be used currently to help curb this horrible situation? Everything that's going on here is driven by the international market. Everything. Whether it's the wood, whether it's petrol, or whether it's the future of drinking water in the rivers. So the responsibility comes from the market. The only thing that the present government in Peru understands is economics and quick profit. And quick profit for a very small group. So investors, foreign investors get excellent conditions. The moral weight now is with the international group, with the United States, with people who claim they support democracy, with people who claim they're concerned about climate change. They've now got a chance, the United States, to really put weight against this Peruvian government, against policies which are bringing tremendous damage, not only ecological damage, but economic damage to people who desperately need development, but they don't need development where they continue to be what we call here peones simply workers paid by the boss. They need to be participators. They need to have shareholders or shares in the future of this area. And that means a change in the economic system. But the responsibility is with the market. What's your perception, Paul, with this whole climate change role that the Amazon forest could have in helping solve the problem? We've got to maintain the forest, improve the forests have been degraded, and at the same time, that's going to give a, a wonderful uh, infusion of economic support for the communities that most need it. But that finance needs to go direct to these communities. It can't go through the corrupt government system. And that's the challenge. Thank you very much.